Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Gambles, and welcome back to the full card breakdown. This time for UFC Noche, UFC 306, whatever you want to call it, it is a phenomenal pay-per-view, one that has been hyped up for a very, very long time, one that I'm excited to dive into tonight. Now, I say tonight, I do get this video out a bit later this week. Uh, it's been busy times, but a, a fight card that I'm still happy to talk about nonetheless. Ten fights to talk about. I, I am going to attack this more from a DraftKings perspective, but with so little fights, I want to fly through this thing. Hopefully, keep it a shorter video. Hopefully, give you guys all the information you need to. Make sure to like button down below, subscribe to the channel, check out a style with Sharon, check out Cool Bet, check me out on Twitter. Plenty of content, plenty of free content at that, and, and I appreciate you guys for checking it out. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive in. Now let's set the stage. It's UFC Noche in the sphere. They call it a cinematic masterpiece like we've never seen before. What does that mean? I have no idea. I have no idea what to expect in terms of camera quality or types of movies we're getting in between fights or what's the production going to be. But what I do know is we do have 10 fights that is centered around Mexican Independence Day. And that is headlined, or sorry, started off by a huge Mexican prospect here in Raul Rochas Jr., 9-1, and one, facing the 25-11 and 11, Arichi Lang. And this is a spot where Raul Rochas Jr. is that 19-year-old prospect a huge hyped up guy in this division who who did succumb to the the uh higher level of christian rodriguez but has been dominant when facing lower level competition only 19 years old but extremely aggressive phenomenal ground game good striking i showed against terrence mitchell but a, a very gra aggressive grappler who gets takedowns early establishes top control looks to choke people out Richie Lang is more of that Chinese brawler. He, he's got power in his hands. He himself, is, he can usually take a punch. He's pretty durable. Can land, land takedowns in his own right. But I do think it's a setup fight here for Rollo versus Junior. He is going to be the aggressor on the mat. We have seen Richie Lang taken down three times by Jay Perrin, a few times by Cody Durden. And I do think Rollo versus Junior is able to take him down, establish control, and threaten submissions. He's extremely aggressive. And I do think he would not be on this card without a matchup uh, setup for him to succeed here. He is the A-side. He is a hyped-up prospect and someone who they are looking to promote, not only on one of these huge cards, but also Mexican Independence Day. I do think Rollo Russell Jr. here is set up for success. Now, does it come in terms of submission decision? I I'm not too sure. Richie Lang has been pretty sound, but this is going to be a big step up in competition in terms of the aggressive nature of Earl Russell Jr. So a decision could be on the table. First, second round submission is probably the most likely outcome, but a fight that I don't have too much financial involvement in. It's more so the drafting side of things I want to target. 9.7K, again, a 10 fight slate. So you can find underdogs get up to him, but the most expensive on the slate, slate by $500, but minus 400 wins on the distance. He is expected to go out there and score very well. Scored 100. 11, 132, and 106 in his three wins so far in the UFC. My favorite would be play if you have the salary going to afford him. I do think he is a solid play who should win a lot of the time, who does have the ceiling to go along with that price tag. I am getting to him wherever I can if I can afford that salary. Next up, 11 and 5, Edgar Charters, the 10 and 2 at Joshua Van. Joshua Van stepping in on short notice after being knocked out by Charles Johnson a couple months ago. And I think it's a really fun fight. Joshua Van is a phenomenal pressure boxer. He's got good hands, good leg kicks as well. He's fun and he's got a lot of hype because of it because he's still only 22 years old. He still continues to go out there and improve. And he's a fighter who's just very entertaining to watch. Edgar Chires is a Mexican brawler who we haven't really seen too much of. I mean, his last three fights scheduled were uh, against Daniel Lacerda. One that got called off too early, then he disposed him accordingly in the last time. But a guy who, although has that submission recently, is a primary striker, wants to go out there and brawl on the feet, has extremely good durability, has good power, has a good ability to, to, to build as life goes on as well, and can mix it up on the match, shall it go there. Losing a tire, I'm not going to give him too much fault to. Even Clayton Carpenter, I do like Carpenter there too. So, Charles is a fighter who I do think can have success here. In a spot like this, although I think gun to my head, I would pick someone like Joshua Van, I think this line is wide. Joshua Van takes a little bit to get going. And although his volume is is very good on the feet and he can go out there and break people, I think Chires can win round one. I think Chires can compete on the feet with a strike. I mean, that's the type of style that, that Chires wants to fight with. And we just saw Joshua Van coming off of a knockout two months ago. So is his chin uh, injured at this point in time? Has he recovered properly? I'm not sure. I think Edgar Chires is a live underdog to win this spot. If the line continue to climb, I may take a dog shot on Chires because I think he's getting the fight he wants and he can compete in the strike with Van. Now, Van, yes, Van is the, the A side of the matchup. He is still someone who, who I think is going to rate out better long term. And I do think he's my pick to win. But the line value is off. I I, I do my, not mind Edgar Chires this week as an underdog play. And because of that on DraftKings, a solid guy I'm looking towards. I mean, 7.3K, we haven't seen him get into many brawls. I mean, two fights against Lacerda and then Tyra. Like, it's so hard to judge that. But Van can be hit. Van will walk forward. And, and I do think with the knockout upside Chires has, the durability Chires has, and the volume he'll throw in his own right, I do think he rates it as a phenomenal play on DraftKings. And I think at 7.3K, he's not going to gain her too much love. I mean, Van is a pretty hyped up prospect. I, I think Chires could go overlooked. And he's a good way for me to get different this week. I, I don't mind him. Van is for thing has scored well. I, I mean, he, he has scored 134, 106 before. But with Chires' durability, 
Tyrus' ground game, I, I think Van's points come all in the form of striking, and that's 8.9k. I prefer other options around him. I think I'm going to go with Tyrus more on DraftKings this week. The official pick is going to be the guy in Joshua Van, but a, a fight where they could get dicey, and I may have a shot in the dog here. Next up, 11-1, Yasmin Yoregi versus the 14-4, Ketlin Souza, in another spot where I do think they have the Mexican fighter primed to succeed here. Yasmin Yoregi is a very well-rounded prospect, phenomenal striking on the feet, good volume, good pressure, decent power, but also a very underrated ground game, and she has showcased that in a few of her last fights. She is very versatile down there and is a solid prospect who I can think can have a solid career here in the UFC. Ketlin Souza is... is Pretty similar to Argyle in terms of like, yeah, she's pretty well-rounded, solid ground game, very good power on the feet, maybe not the most volume, but everything she does, I think, is just a, a level a bit inferior to your Argyle here. I don't mind the power of Souza, and maybe as this line climbs, it's getting a bit out of hand here, but more times than not, your Argyle is going to be the quicker striker who wins the optics, who has the ability to go out there and... Um, impress the Mexican crowd here on Mexican Independence Day and win the optics because of that. I think she's competing on the ground as well, threatened submissions, and we have seen Sosa submit it before. And I do think Yuragi has multiple paths of getting it th this done. I like her volume, I like her technicality, and I like her ground game shallot go there as well. I think Yuragi is a solid play this week and she should win this at a high clip. Drafting's wise though is dangerous because you're, you're relying on so much. Her last win, she only went out there, scored 68 against Hughes, scored 65 against Lucindo. She is content to just outstrike her opponents in the feet, and I do think she will have a clear striking advantage here. So she is just a pure GPP play because I do think she can score better in the path, and if the field's going to be off her because of her box score, I do think she has an opponent in front of her who is breakable, who is there to be finished, and I do think Ray could score better than she has in the past, but really not a name I'm really hoping to click on to. Like, I'd much rather pay up for Rosas if I'm able to. So uh, getting to your again GBP formats, I do think she'd be a little, a little bit of leverage, but she would, should win this fight more times than not. Next up, 15 and 2, Manuel Torres. 15 and 5, Ignacio Bahamondes. And this is a super fun fight. A very close one, too, uh, because I do think it go a multitude of ways. Manuel Torres is that aggressive bulldozer. 4 0 under the UFC banner, averaging 107 fantasy points. The guy is explosive. All those wins coming in the very, very first round. He just went out there, knocked out Mata with one of the most hellacious elbows, threw around Chris Duncan, and dominated on the mat as well. Manuel Torres is a good fighter. He's very explosive early on. He has a ton of power in his hands, but there's still questions to be answered. I don't think his style wins the most minutes i don't I haven't really seen his cardio cast too much and his ground game is still something that is a little bit suspect as well so his physicality is there his athleticism there his power is there and i do think he can have a ton of success here in this division but a, a guy who i'm still uncertain where I, i'm gauging his skill set ignacio baja monday is a guy who i've been a bit shorter on I, i'm not the biggest fan of him long term but he is a guy who i've seen go 15 minutes a guy with phenomenal volume good technicality great frame for this division as well and a guy who's more willing to point fight who's more who has proven that he can go out there win minutes with a striking very long snappy jab can wrestle defensively pretty well as well and a guy who has shown a 15 minute fighting capability so it's pretty simple Manny Torres wants him in this fight i think has to go out there and dominate him early can he do it Maybe. I mean, he's got a ton of power. Matt Bahamondes has been rocked, but does recover well. I think Torres is live to win early on, but as the fight goes, I think Bahamondes is able to win the minutes, win the exchange. If he survives early, should win this fight. Because of that, I think a live entry is live for Bahamondes. I think I'm actually going to pick him outright. He's a more proven fighter here. And although it's really scary to go out there and choose him, I think he, he is very allowed to go out there and, and cash a plus 550 decision ticket because he wins more minutes that way, and especially to keep him at bay. Horrible comparison, but if Ignacio Bahamondes fights best physical capabilities, this could look like Volkov versus Pavlovich, where the long ranger striker is able to keep that powerful force in front of him at bay and Torres. So Bahamondes doesn't always fight like that, but he, I think he has the skills to do so, and in a perfect world, he does. Very close fight, but I will side with Ignacio Bahamondes. Drafting wise, though, I do prefer the Torres side of things. Like I mentioned, average 107 points in his wins. Phenomenal drafting score. I will have some of it because of it. Bahamondes has been up and down in the scoring, but I see his path to victory being more decision based and volume based and because of that Torres brings more upside for me on DraftKings you can play either one of them and although I'm picking Baja Mondays I think Torres's round one win equity has more credit to him on DraftKings and I will be playing some of him because of it phenomenal fight but give me Ignacio Baja Mondays on the money line and Manuel Torres on DraftKings and then the prelude headliner the 15 and 7 Irene Aldana 11 and 2 Norma Dumont in a fight that I'm not gonna spend too much time on because it is the fight that is most expected to go the distance I do not see myself having too much shares on DraftKings and a fight that I do think is pretty close the better striker here is Irene Aldana the better grab here is Norma Dumont. Because of that, I, I, it seems like a pretty binary matchup. Ariana Aldana, I think, is a very good, powerful striker on the feet, and I do think D Dumont can compete with her, but I, I do think Aldana should be winning those metrics there. The flip side of things, though, I've seen Aldana taken down, I've seen her controlled, and Dumont seems to be that's her game plan recently. Because of that, I typically lean with a wrestler. That's just my style. I also think Dumont can blast leg kicks on the feet. I think she's a very um, aggressive, powerful fighter in her own right. And although the striking may look hindsight favorite for Aldana, I think Dumont has more ways of getting it done 
being close in the feed, but having the advantage in the clinch, having the advantage on the mat, and doing the shiz wrestling to get it done. Because of that, it's dogger passing me on DraftKings as well. 7.8K. I mean, she only scored over 100 points once, and that was against Ashley Evan Smith. But I do think she has wrestling path to victory and leverage because of that. Not my favorite play. I won't be giving this uh, too much credit on DraftKings because it is a fight that is plus 350 and it's at a distance, but a spot where if I was to choose a side, I would pick Norma Dumont. On to the main card, 16-2, and two, Ronaldo, Lazy Boy Rodriguez for the 12-7, and seven, Ode Osborne. I think this is a really fun fight. Worthy to be on a main card pay-per-view? Maybe not, but a fun one where we do have a young Mexican prospect looking to go out here on success. And I don't think Lazy Boy is necessarily the best technical fighter. I mean, he, he's got holes in his striking, a bit sloppy that way, can be taken down. But he's a dog. He's got an incredible work rate, great durability, phenomenal cardio, and he will continue to push forward through all adversity. Ode Osborne's a bit different. I think Ode Osborne is, is maybe the opposite in terms of Ode Osborne's a better technical striker. I think he's a better technical wrestler as well. And he's a guy who I think is a very solid fighter, but he quits in fights. He can be hit. He can be knocked out. He can be submitted. And, and a guy who just doesn't always want to find that inner level to continue fighting. Whereas that's really what Ronaldo Rodriguez strives on. So I think this fight could go two ways. One, Ode Osborne pieces him up, wins a decision, which could be a good plus money price tag. But more times than not, Ronaldo Rodriguez breaks him continues that forward pressure, looks to uh, make Ode Osborne quit inside there with that grit, determination, durability. And I do think that could be something that could uh, help us get paid this weekend. So I ended up signing with Ronaldo Rodriguez. Not my comp most confident play because I do think now, Ori Osborne's more technical and probably the better fighter overall, but on Mexican Independence Day with the heart, the grit that Ronaldo brings and the, the quitting I've seen Ode Osborne did, I have to choose Lazy Boy here. He's my pick to win. I think you can sprinkle in the round three props as well. I think it should be a fun fight, but and end up picking Rodriguez. Draftings wise I think Audi Osborne's a, a fine underdog. Like I said, he could win this fight. He has gone out there. He beat Charles Johnson, which is a, a very good win in the past. He does have power, and, and you know what? Rodriguez does get hit, although he's super durable. I think Audi Osborne's a fine underdog, and like I said, has a solid chance of winning, but more times than not, I do think it's Ronaldo Rodriguez, and he did score 106 in his first win. I think his style, if he's able to go out there and break people, could score very well, and at 8.6K, I think it's a solid mid-range play, especially when we're counting in leverage, because he will not be as popular as the Lopez, O'Malley, Grasso's around him, and that could give him some leverage this week. I don't mind him. I think it's a solid fight in general. Uh, one will have some mild involvement on DraftKings, but the pick is going to be Ronaldo Rodriguez. Then we have the 15-1 Daniel Zell Huber and the 13-1 Esteban Rebovich. Another very fun fight. A, a very similar fight to the match one where we have the more aggressive fighter who lacks technicality, who is there going for the kill and win moments in Esteban Rebovich versus the more versus the more polished minute winner, the more tactical technician, let's put it that way, and Daniel Zell Huber, who was able to have the in-and-out movement, who was a solid grappler, a very good striker with his technicality minute winning ability. And the only difference I think I see in this one is Zell Huber is able to sustain this pace for 15 minutes, and I think he's going to have the opportunity to go out there and piece up a guy like Rubovich. Rubovich is extremely dangerous. He's coming off that head, head kick KO of a guy like Terrence McKinney, but a guy who I think can be hit, can be taken down, and loses optics that way. Yes, he's able to win moments with his solid power and his aggression, but more times than not, Zell Huber is going to be landing the more dominant, but more times than not, Zell Huber is going to be landing the more dominant optics on the feed, be winning the mins with the striking, having the pace and pressure to do that for all 15 minutes, and potentially even sprinkling takedown because of it as well. And I do think he wins this fight more times than not. This is a spot where I do think Zell Huber is the rightful favorite and a guy who should win this fight a good majority of the time. DraftKings wise, though, I don't have any interest on him. 9K, he has never eclipsed 84 points, and that was in a second round sub against Jagos. His style is fun. He's a good technician, but doesn't always shoot takedowns, doesn't have the much finish equity, is okay to win a decision with volume. And because of that, he's not going to outscore someone like Lopez or, or Arosa in a win who are so much more aggressive with grappling upside. So, Zell Huber is one of the larger fades for me in the slate. I will have some ownership of him due to some wrestling upside, but not getting him too often. Rubich does have KO upside, so maybe I'll sprinkle him at 7.2K, but he is more of a punt play. Not my favorite fight from a draft perspective. I am picking Zell Huber to get this done by decision. And let's move on to the big three. That big three starts off with the 25 and six Diego Lopez and the 16 and three Brian Ortega. This fight is rebooked and a fight that I've really been struggling with uh, to say the least. Uh, Brian Ortega is an extremely underrated fighter. Great volume, phenomenal grappling, been at the top of the division against great level of competition. I think he's a phenomenal fighter, but I'm not liking the optics I'm seeing from him. And the difference between this fight and the last time I broke it down where I did pick Ortega is Ortega is a guy who I think's heart's not always in it. In a spot like this, what has changed since I last broke it down was Ortega struggled to make weight struggle have his heart in it, where I saw Lopez, although not have the best performance, I think looked like an improved striker. He closes distance extremely fast, has a good in and out movement with power in his hands, has shown durability, durability to absorb damage. And I think in a spot like this, although it's, it's very viable to say Ortega can take him down and, and lay on top of him and win minutes that way, 
I think more times than not, Lopez is the more dynamic fighter, the better athlete at this point in time, uh, who is younger, fresher, more explosive, who not only can win the moments with his striking, potentially also threaten scrambles on the mat as well. I think it's a very close fight. I do not fault anybody for taking Ortega at plus money, but gun to my head, I am picking the youth, the activity, and just the willingness to be in there of Diego Lopez. I think it's gonna be a super fun fight, and, and I don't have the most bullish reads on it, but I'm picking Lopez. Traffic wise though, this is a spot where I don't mind having a shares in Ortega, right? He's 7.5K, he allows you to get to a lot of options up top, great volume, great wrestling, potential jujitsu. And I think he's a guy who, you know what, we've seen him go out there score 118, 110 before, and he can give you a lot of leverage as an underdog. Flip side of things though, I will get to Lopez too. He closes distance very well. He is very fast. And if he is that much more explosive and athletic than Ortega, he could go out there and land a ton of strikes. Ortega does get hit a lot. He does he does have the opportunity to be put in precarious situations. So um, that could allow her a very high score. I don't mind Lo Lopez on DraftKings. He's my pick to win the fight in general, but maybe not my favorite play. I preferred paying down to a O'Malley or other stuff we'll talk about and getting up to Riley Rosa Jr. Co-main event, we have the 16-3-1 Alexa Grasso versus the 23-4-1 Valentina Shevchenko. Third time we're seeing this fight go down, and my reach stays the same, is I'm on Valentina Shevchenko. These three girls have fought three times. The very first time Valentina Shevchenko was minus 800, won three of those rounds, uh, and then slipped up and lost. Their rematch, Valentina Shevchenko was minus 170, and she won that fight. That's my opinion. I thought she won the fight. I think she won all three rounds. That 10-8 at the end was, was, was brutal. Um, she got robbed. Um, with that out of the way, though, now she's coming in as a plus 120 underdog, and I don't get it. Yes, you can mention the age factor, but I just think Valentina Shevchenko has more avenues going to get done. Gross is a phenomenal striker, and I think Grosso could win exchanges, but Valentina has a bunch of these levels. She's hungry to win. She is one of the greatest to, to ever do it, and she's also working on that wrestling as well. She has gotten those takedowns. She implemented optics that way, and I, I think she may have got tentative last time. She's not going to want to see this taken by the crooked judges one more time. Grosso is a very fun fighter. I like her volume. I think both these girls are very talented, but I think it's unjust to make Shevchenko a plus 125 underdog when she has proven that she can win multiple rounds against Grosso. I mean, she's won seven of nine rounds against her. I don't know. I, 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 I'm I struggling with this one. The only reason I'm not going out there laying a couple units, two, three units on Valentina at plus money is because it's Mexican Independence Day <laughs> and Grosso. I don't want to see that. My heart broke one more time of those lines. I'm picking Valentina. I'm very confident in it. Um, maybe not the most confident, but I do think it's unjust to make it the underdog here, and she would be my pick to win. Drafting is wise, though, this is almost like a must-play fight, especially in cash. Um, both these girl girls scored above 90 points last time in a draw without the win bonus. If one of them won, if Valentina would have won like she was supposed to, would have scored 120. I mean, I mean, she averages 96 points in every appearance in her UFC, scored 80 points in her loss the first time they fought. Um, great cash play. I would stack this in cash. Both these girls fight at a very high pace, very good uh, striking, grappling, and, and I don't mind either of them. I lean towards Shevchenko because I'm picking her to win because she has more grappling upside and she's cheaper on DraftKings, but I do not fault, taking, fault anyone for taking Grasso either. Should be a fun fight, but give me Valentina Shevchenko. And the main event, we have the 18-1 Sean O'Malley versus the 17-4 Marab Duvalishvili. And I've gone back and forth with this one too. I think this is an extremely tough fight to call because you know my first instinct was, yeah, Sean O'Malley can go out there and land at left hook. He, he, he just needs one shot to put Marab out and we've seen Marab rocked. I can't wait to get some good plus money on Sean. But we're not. He's now a minus 140 favorite at the time of filming this. Marab is coming down as an underdog and it's just so hard for me to comprehend because Sean was just a plus 220 underdog to Aljo, who, yes, has better control than Marab, but the fear was Aljo was going to take him down. And although Aljo wasn't able to have success, we know Marab is going to continue pushing forward until he can't anymore. He's got great resiliency. He will go out there and shoot a million takedowns, one of the highest work rates you've ever seen inside the UFC. And it's so weird to see him as an underdog in, in matchups. I do think he has the pace to go out there and beat Sean O'Malley. And I think when it comes down to it, you can look at it a couple ways. He doesn't have the same control, but he's got a ton of takedown upside to win optics, to throw them all around the cage, as long as he keeps his chin safe. So I've gone back and forth. I think from a drafting perspective, I'm going to prefer the uh, Duval Shreely side because he's one of the best drafting scorer of all time. He's eclipsed 160 points a couple times. And at an underdog price tag, I'm going to have a lot of ownership of him. But what do I see being most likely outcome? I mean, Sean O'Malley's got good cardio. We're never worried about that. He maybe has a better pure jiu-jitsu. We know he has a better striking, and he only needs one shot to find the chin of Marab Duvalishvili. Um, I, I think it's it's a it's a toss-up. I, I know I pick Marab for DraftKings, but gun to my head, if I had to pick a winner right now, I, I think Sean O'Malley has, has the damage optics and has the ability to go out there and put out a guy like Marab. I just don't know if I want to pay chalk for it. So I wouldn't mind getting plus money. If you got plus money on Sean O'Malley, good credits to you, but a really fun fight. I will also be playing the Sean O'Malley set on DraftKings because he also scores very well, has the ability to land that knockout punch. Um, on 10 fights late, I think you got to have either side of this matchup, either the wrestling upside of Marab or the power of Sean O'Malley. But 
That's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I quickly ready to my quick picks. I ended up signing with Sean O'Malley, but that is a coin flip. Valentina Shevchenko, Diego Lopez, Daniel Zell Hubert, Ronaldo Rodriguez, Norma Dumont, Ignacio Bahamondes, Yasmin Yuregi, Joshua Van, but I'm liking some upside in the underdog here in Chires and Raul Rosas Jr. DraftKings wise, I love paying up for Rosas Jr. I think in the mid range, Lopez, Rodriguez, O'Malley are great options. I think mean, you have to have Grasso, Shevchenko, and Cash. I love them in GP as well. And then Torres, Stros right now, it's a good option in that mid range. Underdog wise, Shevchenko, Dumont, Marab are phenomenal plays. And I really do like Chires as an ability to keep it close to win optics that way as well. And potentially even sneak away a victory here against Joshua Van. I think he's a solid underdog with potentially good leverage. No bets posted. I'll probably get around to betting Valentina Shevchenko, but check me out on Twitter at GamblesGoro to see my final slate. Check out Cool Bet. Check out Established Throne. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. I wish you all the best of luck in all your DraftKings and betting endeavors this weekend, guys. Check me out for Dana White Contender Series, and let's make some money.